want to start out with a story. I know it's hard to believe. Um, when I was in school, I always dreaded those parent-teacher conferences because they'd come back and my dad would say, well, they say you uh, talk a lot, you say a lot of stories. You tell a lot of stories. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but um, today I'm going to open up with a story that kind of talks about my childhood. Believe it or not, when I was younger, um, about 50 years younger, I was much skinnier than I am now. Something happened with all those buffets. Um, but I used to have bright red hair, which now I have very little of it, and I used to have freckles. But I had an older brother, and if you or anybody else here has an older brother, you know older brothers like to prove they're stronger than you all the time. I don't care if we're sitting at the dinner table, I don't care if we are in the church pews, you're either going to get a noogie, you're going to get a twisted arm, you're going to get a kick under the table, and it just seemed like it was relentless. Um, so somewhere around the fourth grade, I seen an ad in the back of one of my Marvel comic books that caught my attention. And here's the ad. For you that don't know, um, that is Charles Atlas right there. And for some of you, you're like, I don't know who that guy is, but for a fourth grader that was getting pounded on by your older brother, I wanted to be that guy right there. Um, and the cool part was is that the promise was made, guaranteed method to obtain this new body. So what I did was is I looked through the thing. I really didn't know if it was true until I found out that Charles Atlas, the company, was in New York. And I'm here in the big town of Kent City, so anything from New York's got to be true. So <laughs> I started to save my money. And back then, it wasn't like, hey, we just get a credit card and you order the thing. No, you had to go get a money order. Well, I wasn't old enough to get a money order. So I convinced my mom, and I said, hey, if I get the money, can I buy it? And then she said, sure. And then when she looked at it, she did that old mom thing. All I wanted to do was to look like that He-Man right there. But my mom, in her most loving, convincing voice, she said, listen, son, she says, I just don't think that that is going to help you achieve what you want. And then she went on to really burst my bubble, and she said, I think all they really want is your money. And for me, that little head, that voice in my head was thinking, Charles Atlas, are you kidding me? Your guarantee is a fraud. But I, I didn't understand it at the time, but later on in life, I figured out this. A lot of people can guarantee something, but they normally don't have the means to deliver what they promised. It's tough lessons for a fourth grader, but I'm sure all of us have lived out false guarantees or promises in one way or another. And today, it might be one of these days where you get free. Maybe somebody promised you in a relationship that they would be there forever. Maybe it was a mom or a dad that all of a sudden was no longer around. Maybe, maybe it was just one of those where you bought into something thinking it was guaranteed money and they rolled up the front sidewalks and took off with your money. No promises delivered there, no guarantee. But we all have lived it. And today I'm going to let you see what a real guarantee looks like. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just bow before you and we thank you, Lord, for your love. And I thank you, Lord, for this congregation. Lord, I pray today that as we look through your word, that it would be your word that comes through. I pray for those who have been wounded in the past by people saying they guarantee something. Lord, I pray for them today that they could be released and know that they can trust you. Lord, I pray for healing. I think there are a lot of people in here that honestly have maybe been fed some bad theology. I pray today be the day that that gets straightened out also. But mainly today, Lord, I pray that you're glorified in all that is said here. And I pray, Lord, that we walk out of this auditorium with your word, knowing that we can take on the day a lot different than we did today. And Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've got one of those Bibles, um, if you want to open up, we're going to go to Ephesians 1, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. And as you are turning there, last week, if you remember, Pastor Chris was in Ephesians 1, and he did 6 through 12. 
And he basically taught us what the sending of the beloved meant to us. How the beloved brought redemption, riches, and ultimately revelation. So this morning I want to look at verses 11 through 14, but then after that we are really going to camp in verses 13 and 14. But I want to kind of give you the connection of how those verses all tie together. So verse 11, it says, and I have an old NIV, by the way, so if the words are just a little bit different, I, I do apologize, but the meaning will be there. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. There's a lot in those verses, and we are going to try to unpack them. We are going to be moving back and forth um, with some other verses to, uh, to really look at the truth a little more in depth. And we're going to basically end up in, in the New Testament. But we're going to move back and forth. If you want to make sure that you can keep your finger or something in those verses there, because we will be coming back there quite a bit. But today I want to really explore three truths from these verses. The Holy Spirit's role in salvation, because I do believe that some of us maybe through time, maybe didn't completely understand what his role is. The Holy Spirit as the seal, because I think sometimes that we don't see him as the seal. And the Holy Spirit guarantee and what that brings to us as believers in our daily lives. So the first thing I really want to look into is the Holy Spirit's role in salvation. And as we just read in verse 13, it said that you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. I think in order to get the right foundation, like anything that you build on, you must have the proper foundation. And one of the things that I think that we do not spend enough time and thought and prayer on is the foundation that you must totally understand that the Bible is God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit. We're not going to turn there, but it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it talks about that. If, if you're taking notes, that's one of those verses you need to go back to and really read that and understand that that is your foundation. That is our foundation. Because if this isn't true, all of it, then we're really wasting our time. This is not a book that you can just take and say, hey, I don't like page 98, I'm ripping that out. And hey, by the way, I don't like one five, three, eight, either, I'm ripping that out. It's not like that. And the problem is, is that even myself, I will be honest, there are certain verses that I love. I don't know about you, but I love the verses that talk about God's grace, God's love, God's mercy. And I love to live in those. But there's also other verses in here that are a little tougher when it talks about God's justice. But it's all true, and it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we need to really understand that. See, when I was a kid, when I first got saved, they handed me a King James Version of the Bible, and it had nothing on the bottom of it. It was a nice Bible, don't get me wrong, I still have it. But I really didn't understand a lot of it, because it talked about he begot who, and who begot this, and who begot that, and it just wasn't the way in which we spoke. It wasn't the way that I spoke. So I had a hard time understanding it. And I remember when they gave me the Bible, I said, where should I start? <laughs> At that time, it was a deacon that gave me the Bible, and he said, uh, I'd start, I guess, page one. Okay, so I started with page one. Um, don't get me wrong, there's not really a bad spot to start, but when you're a new believer, maybe there's a better place that we could start that would really talk about what God has done with us and for us. But the important problem that I had was is that I went to a Bible school shortly thereafter to another church, and they basically told me that this was the owner's manual. This is your owner's manual. I've got to be honest with you. It's not the owner's manual. It's not. But what it is, is it is the story 
of the greatest love ever shown. It's the story of your redemption. It's the story of your redemption. And it's built on promises of a holy God. And why is it that we must understand a holy God? Because if the promises were built just on by any God, it doesn't mean they're going to be true. But a holy God cannot lie. A holy God is completely holy. You must take that. And if once you secure that, what happens is, is that the Bible kind of changes. The promises become trustworthy, but they really become personal. And that's what happens. That's what changes. And we're going to talk about that. Let's, uh, let's first, as I am getting ready, let's turn to John. Let's go back to John 16. We're going to go to chapter 16, verse 7 through 11. See, because one of the things that happens is, is that when you are still living in darkness and by the flesh, really what happens is the Bible seems like what? What's it seem? When you first start reading the Bible, if you are not part of God's family, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, what is this book then? Foolishness, right? When you start talking today in the world, and you start talking about how you believe in the Bible, and that's what the Bible says, most of them tell you, come on. Come on. Really? You believe that? And we're going we're gonna to really see that we need to believe that. But fortunately for all of us, God sends his spirit to us to call us to himself. God calls you to himself. Let's look at John 10, or 16, I'm sorry, um, and we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. And this is Jesus' words, and he's teaching about the Holy Spirit. And he says, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. What's very interesting about that, if you was not of Christ, the first thing that you would notice, and even as you become of Christ, the first thing you notice is that the Holy Spirit could not come unless Jesus what? Jesus had to leave. Jesus had to complete his mission and leave. Without Jesus, there could be no salvation, no payment for our sins. But there's other things, according to these verses, of the Holy Spirit's primary task. And I want to take a look at these, three of them. The first was the Holy Spirit was sent to convict the world of their sins, calling them to repentance. The Holy Spirit is to reveal God's righteousness standards to all believers And the Holy Spirit shows Christ's victory and judgment over Satan. When it comes to convicting the world of their sins, I don't know if you've noticed this, but they don't take it very nice. They don't. When the Holy Spirit convicts people of sins, what have we noticed around us today more than ever before? How hostile to God and his word. And you all know it. We are silenced as believers a lot of the times around our places of work, where we shop. Um, and why that is, is because if we mention it, if we, if we do anything, they get very nasty. To the point of that if you talk about God, you are somehow known looked at as a radical. But really, if you really think about it, I mean, they will even go so far as to pass new laws to take God out as much as possible. One of the things about 10 years ago that amazed me was is to watch as they strip the Ten Commandments off public buildings. Do you remember when they're taking them out of the courts? The Ten Commandments all of a sudden were a bad thing. And I kept thinking to myself, the Bible talks about as end times come, they don't want to see that. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to believe that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit uses his word to convict the world of their sins. They don't like it. They just don't like it. But just because they don't like it doesn't mean that it's not true. 
They can think all they want. They can do all they want. They can pass their own laws. They can change things. But if it's in here, in God's word, and it says it's wrong, it's still wrong. It's still wrong. So as for me, talk about that little guy again, back in about the eighth grade. I myself was just sitting in Sunday school being the nice kid that I am, wrestling with a guy next to me. We were slapping and we were just having a ball. Bonnie Buckner, um, who is Mike and Steve's mom, was teaching primary church. And I got to tell you, I had to be careful in there because Bonnie was really close with my mother. And the problem is, is that Bonnie was, also had, um, her husband Neil was best friends with my dad. So if that ever got back to my dad, I knew I was going to get it for screwing around in Sunday school. But for whatever reason on that day, she was teaching Sunday school, I found myself convicted of my life in the eighth grade of my sins. It wasn't Bonnie's words. It was the Holy Spirit using the word of God and drawing me near to Jesus. After she got done with the message, she said, hey, if you have been convicted today and you want to find out more about it, raise your hand. Unbeknownst to me, the guy I was messing with, he raised his hand too. And then she said, hey, when everybody leaves, if you raise your hand, I'm going to be over in this other side room. Come talk to me. And I'm surprised he came with me. And she thought we were messing around. And she said, hey, are you guys messing around or do you guys really want to learn? Um, and I looked at him, I'm, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? Well, I think I need a savior. And he said, so do I. And it was interesting. So she showed us and she went through scripture. And it was the typical scripture that you talk about. It was John 3, 16. But I want to show you one that I had never seen before until that day. And she showed this to us. If you would turn over to Romans 1. So if you can imagine, I basically had no idea how this was all happening, but the Holy Spirit was drawing me. She gets done and she talks about Romans Road a little bit. She talks about our sins and how Jesus died for our sins. And then she leads us to this and says, this is what you need to do. And she led us to Romans 1, 16 and 17, and she said, this is what Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who what? Believes. She went back over that like three or four times. She says, Doug, do you understand that? And then she went on and she said, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is what? How is it revealed? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals this to you. He's part of this whole salvation plan. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What Bonnie Buckner did is she took me by the hand and she said, Doug, it is not about you. Salvation is God calling you. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Do you believe that he took your place? And I got to be honest with you. That day I was saved. I can't explain it, but there was a guilt that was removed from me. And I got to be honest, it's hard to explain that. I know not everybody gets that salvation story like that, but you hear lots of them similar. Belief is our only part in salvation. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Because I don't know about you, but if you ever put a key of furniture together, you know that I can screw up anything. <laughs> I've got a box of parts. If anybody is missing any IKEA furniture parts, I've got a box of parts. And, and it's not that the dressers lean too far to the left or too far to the right. If you put a screw in the back, they kind of hold up there pretty good. And the drawer almost works. The one drawer, I don't know why, it hooks up. But thank God, I do not have anything to do with my, when it comes to salvation. I have my part to do, believe, and that I could do. Belief is our part, and thankfully God does the rest. Because you know why? We need God's righteousness to bring salvation. But it didn't end there. That very day, the Holy Spirit started to work in my heart, in my sanctification process. For the first time in my life, 
I had a choice when it came to saying no to sin and start to live a a righteous life that God wanted me to live. It isn't an instantaneous thing. It's a long process. And I can be honest, it's still going on now. I'm thankful for God's mercy and his grace as he continues to wring me out of me. That's an old word, ring. But back in the day when kids used to do the dishes, my mother would give us these dishcloth, these rags, and she'd say, ring the dirty water out of the dish dish rag before you start washing the dishes. That's how I see it. Make no mistake about it. Satan was defeated when Christ was crucified and raised from the dead. You need to see or hear this maybe for the first time, but all your sins are paid for if you believe The past, the ones today, the present, and any in the future, all taken care of. Satan has no longer a hold over you. Death is not to be feared as we are now his. The Holy Spirit will testify to those truths and is in us to the end of the redemption story. What a glorious truth that is. Let's look at point number two, Holy Spirit as the seal. Immediately after believing, the Holy Spirit now resides in you. How is that possible? How is it that the Holy Spirit can now come to me? In the morning, when I went to church that morning, I was a broken sinner. By the time I got back in the old 1974 green LTD with a white line do top, I was different. I was changed forever. How is that possible? Let's look up 1 Corinthians 6. Turn to me there, the next book over. 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to look at verse 19 and 20. But how is it the Holy Spirit resides in you? God being holy since Jesus paid for all your sins, now believing he was your substitute, God the Father now sees you through the filter of Christ as, and sees you as righteous. What does that mean? Easiest way to describe it. This is me. Still, still broken, still not completely redeemed. I'm redeemed. It's already a done deal, but I'm still living in that sinful shell. Here I am. God the Father, the Holy, looking down on me, looks through a filter of Jesus' blood. And from that perspective, when God looks down, there is no stain on me any longer. I am holy. I am righteous. I am as Jesus is. And why is that good news? Why is that great news? Because of right here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And what it says is, is that, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. What does that mean? God comes to live inside of you. The Holy Spirit is now in you. How can he do that? Because of Jesus' blood. What an incredible gift. What an incredible gift. Because that gift, as we talked about in Ephesians 1.13, said this, that you are now marked with a seal. The Holy Spirit coming in to live with you is the seal. See, back when Paul was talking about sealing, it was referring to the official mark of identification that was placed on a letter, a contract, or other important document. Back then, when there was kings, they would take and have scribes write on scrolls what they want done. They would then drip hot wax on the edge of the scroll. He would take his signet ring, he would place it in the hot wax, and it created a seal. If you got a scroll and the seal was broken, don't believe a word of it. But if you got a seal that had the the king's signet ring still in it and it's still sealed, everything in that is his words. It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. It was proof of the authenticity of that message written. And the seal of the Holy Spirit in the believer signifies four things that we need to really take a closer look at. And they're right up here. The first thing is, is you need to understand that the seal of the Holy Spirit, as if he stamps us with a seal that reads, this is what the seal would read when you open. This person is mine and is a citizen of heaven. 
and he's a member of my family. It gives it authenticity. It also gives security because the seal made sure that nothing could be changed, remember? The believer being sealed by the Holy Spirit gives us assurance we will always be God's. Do you get that? Do you understand that? It also gives ownership with that signet ring when, it, when, it, when he seals us in the Holy Spirit. It says when a believer is sealed, he marks him as God's property. He's bought by God for God's purposes. He now belongs entirely and eternally to God. Salvation is declared official and final. And the last thing is the authority. When we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we are delegated to proclaim, teach, defend, and minister God's word and the gospel. Not with our authority anymore, but with the Lord's own authority. If you go back to Ephesians, flip back to the book of Ephesians, if you would, and if you flip right on to Ephesians 4, go to Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at verse 30. And the reason is, is because not only is the Ephesians 13 and 14 some incredible verses, but he also gives us another one in Ephesians 4, 30. And if you look at it, what it says is that, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Whom you were sealed. What he's saying is, is that you have been sealed not only by him, but you are also sealed in him. The Holy Spirit is the actual seal. Why is that important? Some religions claim that you can lose your salvation. If you came from a background that taught you that, let me be the first to say, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Because I don't think there could be any crueler thing taught than that. To not know when I put my head on my pillow at night, because maybe I had a bad day in the flesh, not knowing whether or not, if I don't wake up, I don't go to heaven that I'm not going to be in front of Jesus. That's cruel. That's heavy. So let me be the first to say, that is not what Scripture says. That is not what it says. And some people say, well, where does it say else otherwise? Let's go back to John. Let's go to John 10. Let's go back to John 10. Let's go to 10, verse 28 and 29. Again, it is Jesus' words, Jesus himself, that says this. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than who? Greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And he finishes, I and the Father are one. That's incredible. You can't lose your salvation. God promised and sealed you with his own spirit. That is something somebody, I hope today, needed to hear. I have a close friend of mine that was brought up in that bad theology. And I got to be honest with you, he still struggles today. It's terrible. But then I got another friend of mine, and his argument is this. Can I opt out? Can I opt out? I'm like, what does that mean? Can I opt out? Yeah, he says, you know, that's all nice stuff when we're down here in Sunday school and Pee Wees and, you know, we go to Awana and all that other stuff, but what if I decide I don't want that? The thing is, I don't see any scriptures that back that thought. It would make you stronger than God. If you could undo what God says, and God says he's greater than all, it would make you above God to undo what God has promised and has secured you in his hand. Because God saves one way, the best I can tell in, in all of Scripture, and it's forever. It's forever. So the last point I want to talk about is the Holy Spirit guarantees brings confidence. And I'm just going to read, if you get back to Ephesians 13 and 14, 
If you get there, great. If not, but I just want to read this, verse 14. Who has a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory? What's really interesting is we as a society, we like guarantees. We do. I don't know if any of you buy on Amazon, you know, we look at people's ratings, are they trustworthy? But I'll be honest with you, even myself, when I go to buy something, what's the warranty? What's the guarantee? I want to know those things. Even if it gives me just a little security. Great news. God in all his mercy knows we need to have confidence in our salvation. So he guarantees the redemption with the deposit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the down payment. It's interesting, growing up, my dad always talked to me about when I went to buy my first vehicle, he said, make sure you bring some earnest money. Okay, Dad, that must be a dad thing, right? I said, what's earnest money? He says, well, when you go there to buy the car, the guy's going to make sure you're coming back with the rest of the money. We're not going to bring all the money in your pocket. He said, that'd be foolish. But we are going to give him some money down. That's the earnest money. It means that you are going to go through with the deal. But God seals the Holy Spirit as the down payment. He's the earnest money to give us God's pledge of what is to come. God backed his promises with a guarantee. The guarantee should read, it is true with God. That's what it should read. It is true with God. It doesn't need 38 pages of exclusions that talk about the guarantee doesn't pass here and it doesn't pass there. It should, it should be all we need to hear. It's true with God. There's no exclusions. There's no getting out. There's no opting out. It, it's there. It's forever. God is holy, he cannot lie. What better way to cement your future than sending himself, himself to live in you? He sent himself to live in you. No one else can back a promise with just himself because no one else is holy. So if you want to boil it down, God backed his promise with God. I want to end with two verses. If you can turn back to 1 John, we're going to end in that. If you go to 1 John 5, 1 John 5. Now remember, this is John writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but in his later years. And if you ever go through the book, there's going to be a couple words that stick out there a lot. And we're going to read a few of those in here. 1 John 5, verses 13 and 14. And it says, I write these things to you who believe, remember that's our part, in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's an incredible promise. Flip one page back to 1 John 3, 21 and 24. Again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, John writes, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how that we again know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. I don't know about you, but when you read that whole thing, it kind of sounds like it starts with God, we believe, and it all ends in God. Praise the Lord, there's no spot in there for me to screw it up. The Holy God has it all handled, and He gives you a guarantee. He gives you a deposit. Well, what's the deposit for? It's for what's to come. It's what's to come. It gives us confidence in Christ and saving us. And that confidence should change your life. Why? Every day that you get up, you get a chance to go to the throne room and bring all of your fears, all of your needs. And I'll be honest with you, I even bring my wants because he's merciful, he's gracious. Doesn't mean I get those if it's not in his will, but I'm not afraid to ask sometimes. What is, how should it change? Every celebration 
every trial, every heartache, every bad diagnosis, everything should be different. And how should it be different? Right here. We're not going to look up these verses. You could do that this afternoon. You should have peace no matter what you're walking through. Peace because you know how it ends. You should have joy in some of the tougher trials you'll ever go through. It's amazing how you can find joy in that. It's not the suffering that brings us the joy. It's the joy that knowing God has it. And what does that ultimately should lead to? Confidence. Confidence in knowing that it is true. Confidence in knowing that it can't be undone. So the really the only question you got to ask yourself is this. Am I sealed? That's the question. 